So, hello, everyone. Um, I was just talking to my Twitch chat about it. I just started the recording for YouTube, so now YouTube, you are hearing this too. Sorry, Twitch chat, you're going to have to hear it twice. I'm sorry, but a lot of you have been posting different books or series that you guys want me to read next after the series is over. Um, just be mindful that if it is a more expensive series and I don't already own it, um, I don't know if I'll be able to do it right away. I'll put it on my to-be-read list. Um, and also, if you're going to recommend I read a book or a book series, please tell me a little bit about it. There are certain topics and things that I cannot read about on YouTube. Like, I would really love to read a Court of Thorns and Roses series. I own that series already. It's by the same author as this Throne of Glass series is. But I can't read it because it does have some more graphic, intimate sexual scenes in it. Um, and that's not something that I am allowed to read on YouTube. It goes against their terms of service. And I will be demonetized and probably even striked for that type of content. Um, the way that this book explains it is okay because it doesn't use vulgar descriptive words that I can't say out loud. <laughs> um, it like talks about kissing and it talks about those sexual scenes in more of a broader term. It doesn't go like crazy into detail and when we get to the first like mo there's only one scene in the throne of glass series that is rather detailed but it's still not detailed enough to where it's going to affect youtube's terms of service actually i think that chapter might be coming up today um once it gets to that point i will try to pause my reading even if it's in the middle of the chapter i will try to pause it and give a content warning um, just in case, um, I know some viewers can be very sensitive about that topic. So I will put a content warning in, uh, once we get to that. Um, but yeah, so if you have book suggestions, just keep in mind that if there is a graphic sex scene in the book, it is not something that I can read on YouTube, unfortunately. If that's something and there's a certain book series that has it that's getting a lot of traction, you guys really, really want me to read it. The only way that I can do that is if you guys join the Discord and we do a Discord series on it. Then I could potentially do it there through Discord where you guys join the call. But that's just that I wouldn't be able to record it and post it anywhere. Um... I could potentially put it on a Google Drive and share the link for that. But again, that would have to be like a private thing um, where it's just based in Discord. Anyways, with all of that mumbo jumbo and maintenance shit out of the way. Also, no background music because I'm having more technical difficulties. If you actually, if you prefer it this way, please let me know. Put it in the comment section of the YouTube video. Tell me in Twitch chat. Um, if you prefer it this way with no background music, um, let me know and we can do that from here on out. This is me forcing myself, essentially, to test the... Sorry. Um... Sorry. Um... Cryptic text message. Anyways, I can deal with that later. Um, but yeah. Also, I forgot to say hi to my Twitch viewers. Hi, Haley, for the I'm first, and hi. I'm just gonna call you Chaco because I don't know how to pronounce that. You're Chaco. Chaco girl? I don't know. Also, mom's here. You can see her foot. <laughs> um, I don't even know where we're leaving off today. Um, while I figure out I'm going to put the reading guide, I'm pretty sure we're at the Empire of Storms big, big section. Yeah, because of an Empire of Storms, the next chapter, that one's labeled 71. And if I check Tower of Dawn, that one is labeled 88. So we are in our giant 
Empire of Storm section. I don't. I shouldn't even have Tower of Dawn out here. We're not going to get through that this section today. As you see, it is it is very long. So if you're reading along, open your Tower of Dawn books, not Tower of Dawn books, Empire of Storm books, and go to chapter thirty five, which is page three hundred and thirteen. Um, there it is. <clears throat> and we're gonna go ahead and get started. Also, I gotta say, it feels really weird streaming without my headset on. It feels very weird. It feels like I'm naked. In a way. Anyways. Perched on the rail of the sea dragon, Gripping the rope ladder flowing from the looming mast, Aelin savored the cooling spindrift that sprayed her face as the ship plowed through the waves. Once the ship was clear of the others, Rowan had let his winds fill its sail, setting the sea dragon flying toward the mammoth chain. It was hard not to look back as they passed over the submerged chain, and then Shipbreaker began to rise from the water, sealing them out of the bay where Rolf's other ships would wait safely behind the chain's line to guard the town now silently watching them. If all went well, they would only need this boat, she told Rolf. Rolf. And if it went badly, then his ships wouldn't make a difference anyway. Tightly grasping the rope, Aelin leaned out, the vibrant blue and white below passing in a swift blur. Not too fast, she told Rowan. Don't waste your strength. You barely slept last night. He just leaned in to nip at her ear before sliding into Gav onto Gavriel's bench to concentrate. He was still there, his power letting the men cease their rowing and prepare for what swept toward them. Aelin again looked ahead, toward those black sails blotting the horizon. The word key at her chest murmured in response. She could feel them. Her magic could taste their corruption on the wind. No sign of Lysandra, but she was out there. The sun was blinding on the waves as Rowan's magic slowed, bringing them into a steady glide toward the two peaks of the island that curved toward each other. It was time. Aelin swung off the railing, boots thudding on the soaked wood of the deck. So many eyes turned to her, to the chains spread across the main deck. Rolf stalked toward her, descending from the raised quarterdeck where he'd been manning the wheel himself. She picked up a heavy iron chain, wondering who did previously held. Rowan rose to his feet in a steady, graceful movement. He reached her when Rolf did. The captain demanded, What now? Aelin jerked her chin toward the ships near enough to make out figures crammed onto the various decks. Many. Many figures. We draw them in as close as we can. When you can see the whites of their eyes, you shout at us, Rowan added, and then you lay anchor off the starboard side. Swing us around. Why? Rolf asked as Rowan helped her fasten the manacle around her wrist. She balked at the iron, her magic twisting. Rowan gripped her chin between his thumb and forefinger making her meet his unflinching gaze. Even as he said to Rolf, Because we don't want the masts in the way when we open fire. They seem like a rather important part of the ship. Rolf growled and stalked off. Rowan's finger slid to cup her jaw, his thumb brushing her cheek. We draw out our power, slow and steady. I know. He angled his head, brows lifting. A half-smile curved his sinful mouth. You've been spiraling down into your power for days now, haven't you? She nodded. It had taken most of her focus. Had been such an effort to stay in the present. To stay active and aware while she was burrowing down and down. Dragging up as much of her power as she could without attracting any notice. I didn't want to take any chances here. Not if you were drained from saving Dorian. I've recovered. I'll have you know. So this morning's little display. A way to take off the power's full edge, she said wryly, and make Rolf piss himself. He chuckled and released her face to pass her the other manacle. 
She hated its ancient, hideous touch on her skin. On his, as she clamped it around his tattooed wrist. Hurry, Rolf said from where he'd returned to his spot at the wheel. Indeed, the ships were gaining on them. No sign of those sea wyverns, though the shifter also remained out of sight. Rowan palmed his hunting knife, the steel bright in the blazing sun. High noon. Precisely why she'd gone into Rolf's office nearly two hours beforehand. She'd practically rung the dinner bell for the host in the dead end. She'd gambled that they wouldn't wait until nightfall, but they apparently feared the wrath of their master if she slipped their nets more than they feared the light itself, or were too stupid to realize Mala's heir would be at her most powerful. Do you want to do the honors? Or should I? Rowan said. Fenris and Gavriel had risen to their feet, blades out as they monitored from a safe distance. Aelin held out her free hand, her palm scarred, and took the knife from him. A quick slice had her skin stinging, warm blood heating her sweater, seawater sticky skin. Rowan had the knife a heartbeat later, and the scent of his blood filled her nose, sent her, set her senses on edge. But she extended her bloodied palm. Her magic swirled into the world with it, crackling in her veins, her ears. She reined in the urge to tap her foot on the ground, to roll her shoulders. Slow, Rowan repeated, as if sensing the hair trigger that her power was now on. And steady. He shackled an arm. His shackled arm slid around her waist to hold her to him. I'll be with you every step of the way. She lifted her head to study his face, the harsh planes and the curving tattoo. He leaned, in, he leaned in to brush a kiss to her mouth, and as his lips met hers, he joined their bleeding palms. Magic jolted through her, ancient and wicked and cunning, and she arced against him, knees buckling at his, as his cataclysmic power roared into her. All anyone on deck saw, she knew, was two lovers embracing. But Aelin tunneled down, 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 into her power. Felt him doing the same with his. Felt every ounce of ice and wind and lightning go slamming from him into her. And when it reached her, the core of his power yielded to her own. Melted and became embers and wildfire. Became the molten heart of the earth, shaping the world and birthing new lands. Deeper and deeper she went. Aelin had a vague sense of the ship rocking beneath them, felt the faint bite of the iron as it rejected her magic, felt the presence of Fenris and Gavriel flickering around them like candles. It had been months since she'd drawn from so deep in the abyss of her power. During the time she'd trained with Rowan and Wendelin, her power's limit had been self-imposed, and then that day with the Vald, she'd broken through it had discovered an entire hidden level beneath. She had drawn from it when she'd encircled Dorinelle with her power, had taken a whole day to tunnel that far, to draw up what she needed. Aelin had begun this descent three days ago. She'd expected it to stop after the first day, to hit that bottom she'd sensed once before. She had not. And now, now with Rowan's power joining hers, Rowan's arm still held her tightly against him, and she had the distant, murky sensation of his coat scratching lightly against her face, of the hardness of his weapon strapped beneath, the scent of him washing over her, soothing her. She was a stone plunked into the sea of her power. Their power. Down. And down. And down. There. There was the bottom. The ash-lined bottom. The pit of a dormant crater. Only the feeling of her own feet against the wood deck kept her from sinking into that ash, learning what might slumber beneath it. Her magic whispered to start digging through that ash and silt, but Rowan's grip tightened on her wrist, on her waist. Easy, he murmured in her ear. Easy. Still more of his power flowed into her, wind and ice churning with her power, eddying into a maelstrom. Close now, Rolf warned from nearby, from another world. Aim for the middle of the fleet, Rowan ordered her. Send the flanking ship scattering onto the reef. 
where they'd fonder, leaving any survivors to be picked off with arrows shot by Fenris and Rolf's men. Rowan had to be alert then, watching the approaching force. She could feel them, feel her magic's hackles raise in response to the blackness gathering beyond the horizon of her consciousness. Almost in range, Rolf called. She began pulling up, dragging the abyss of flame and embers with her. Steady, Rowan murmured. Higher, higher, Aelin rose, back toward the sea and sunlight. Here, that sunlight seemed to beckon. To me. Her magic surged for it, for that voice. Now, Rolf barked. And like a feral beast freed of its leash, her magic erupted. She'd been doing well as Rowan had handed over his power to her. She'd balked and bobbed a few times, but she had the descent under control. Even if her power... The well had gone deeper than before. It was easy to forget she was still growing, that her power would mature with her. And when Rolf shouted, Now? Rowan knew he had forgotten to, to his detriment. A pillar of flame that did not burn erupted from Aelin, slamming into the sky, turning the world into red and orange and gold. Aelin was ripped from his arms with the force of it, and Rowan ga grabbed her hand in a crushing grip, refusing to let her break that line of contact. Men around them stumbled back, falling onto their asses as they gawked upward in terror and wonder. Higher that column of, column of flame swirled, a maelstrom of death and life and rebirth. Holy gods, Fenris whispered behind them. Still, Aelin's magic poured into the world. Still, she burned hotter, wilder. Her teeth were gritted, her head arced back as she panted, eyes shut. Aelin, Rowan warned. The pillar of flame began expanding, laced now with blue and turquoise. Flame that could melt bone, crack the earth. Too much. He had given her too much, and she had delved too deep into her power. Through the flames encasing them, Rowan glimpsed the frantic enemy fleet, now hurling themselves into motion to flee, to get out of range. Aelin's ongoing display was not for them. Because there was no escape, not with the power she dragged up with her. The display was for the others, for the city watching them, for the world to know she was no mere princess playing with pretty embers. Aelin, Rowan said again, trying to tug on that bond between them. But there was nothing. Only the gaping maw of some immortal, ancient beast. A beast that had opened an eye. A beast that spoke in the tongue of a thousand worlds. Ice flooded his veins. She was wearing the word key. Aelin. But Rowan felt it then felt that bottom of her power crack open as if the beast within that word he stomped its foot and ash and crusted rock crumbled away beneath it and revealed a roiling, molten core of magic beneath it, as if it were the fiery heart of Mala herself. Aelin plunged into that power, bathed in it. Rowan tried to move, tried to scream at her to stop, but Rolf's eyes, but Rolf, eyes wide with what could only be terror and awe, roared at her, Open fire! She heard that, and was, and as violently as it had pierced the sky, that pillar of fire shot down, shot back into her, coiling and wrapping inside her, fusing into a kernel of power so hot it sizzled into him, searing his very soul. The flames winked out at the same second she reached into Rowan with burning hands and tore the last remnants of his power from him. Just as she ripped her hand from his. Just as her power and the word key between her breasts merged. Roman collapsed to his knees, and there was a crack inside his head, as if thunder cleaved through him. As Aelin opened her eyes, he realized it wasn't thunder, but the sound of a door slamming open. Her face turned expressionless, cold as the gaps between the stars. And her eyes, turquoise burned bright, around a core of silver, no hint of gold to be found. That is not Aelin, Fenris breathed. 
A faint smile blossomed on her full mouth, born of cruelty and arrogance, and she examined the iron chain wrapped around her wrist. The iron melted away, molten ore sizzling through the wooden deck and into the dark below. The creature that stared out through Aelin's eyes furled her fingers into a fist. Light leaked through her clenched fingers. Cold white light. Tendrils flickered. Silver flame. Get away, Gavriel warned him. Get away and don't look! Gavril was indeed on his knees, head bowed and eyes averted. Fenris followed suit. For what gazed at the dark fleet assembled, what had filled his beloved's body, he knew. Some primal, intrinsic part of him knew. Deanna, Rowan whispered. She flicked her eyes to him in question and confirmation. And she said to him, in a voice that was deep and hollow, young and old, Every key has a lock. Tell the queen who was promised to retrieve it soon. For all the allies in the world shall make no difference if she does not wield the lock. If she does not put those keys back with it. Tell her flame and iron together bound merge into silver to learn what must be found. A mere step is all it shall take. Then she looked away again. And Rowan realized what the power in her hand was. Realized that the flame she would unleash would be so cold it burned. Realized it was the cold of the stars. The cold of stolen light. Not wildfire, but moonfire. One moment she was there. And then she was not. And then she was shoved aside, locked into a box with no key, and the power was not hers. Her body was not hers. Her name was not hers. And she could feel the other there, filling her, laughing silently as she marveled at the heat of the sun on her face, at the damp sea breeze coating her lips with salt, at the pain of the hand now healed of its wound. So long. It had been so long since the other had felt such things, felt them wholly and not as something in between and diluted. And those flames, her flames, and her beloved's magic, they belonged to the other now. To a goddess who had walked through the temporary gate hanging between her breasts and seized her body as if it were a mask to wear. She had no words, for she had no voice, no self, nothing. And she could only watch, as if through a window, as she felt the goddess, who had perhaps not protected her, but hunted her the entirety of her life for this moment, this opportunity, examined the dark fleet ahead. So easy to destroy it. But more life glimmered behind. More life to obliterate. To hear their dying cries with her own ears. To witness firsthand what it was to cease to be in a way the goddess her never could. She watched as her own hand, wreathed in pulsing white flame, began to move from where it had been aimed toward the dark fleet, toward the unprotected city at the heart of the bay. Time slowed and stretched as her body pivoted toward that town, as her own arm lifted, her fist aimed toward the heart of it. There were people on the docks, the signs of a lost clan, some running from the display of fire she'd unleashed moments ago. Her fingers began to unfurl. No! The word was a roar, a plea, and silver and green flashed in her vision. A name. A name clanged through her as he hurled himself in the path of that fist, that moon fire. Not just to save those innocents in the city, but to spare her soul from the agony if she destroyed them all. Rowan. And as his face became clear, his tattoo stark in the sun, as that fist full of unimaginable power now opened toward his heart, there was no force in any world that could keep her contained. And Aelin Galathinius remembered her own name as she shattered through the cage that goddess had shoved her into. As she grabbed that goddess by the damned throat and hurled her out, 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 through that gaping hole where she had infiltrated her and sealed it. Aelin snapped into her body, her power. Fire like ice, fire stolen from the stars. 
Rowan's hair was still moving as he slammed into a stop before her uncoiling fist. Time launched again, full and fast and unrelenting. Aelin had only enough of it to throw herself sideways, to angle that now open fist away from him, pointed anywhere but at him. The ship beneath her, the center and left flank of the dark fleet beyond her, and the outer edge of the island behind it blew apart in a storm of fire and ice. And that was chapter 35. <laughs> Oh, I gotta turn to a new page. I'm out of space on this page to write my my time slots. I gotta say, in the beginning, like in the middle, I sorry, in the middle of that chapter, Odie, my dog, he farted, and it smelled so bad. It smelled so bad, and I just had to power through it. Just had to power through it. We do gotta wait a minute. We're gonna take a nice little long break. Because uh, mom's going to the bathroom and she didn't take her phone with her. So, hi, avocado. I see you, my girl. I see you. I see you, my puppers. My avocado girl. My avocado girl. I'm super excited, though, because today I subscribed to BarkBox. For those of you that don't know what it is, it's a subscription-based box for dogs. And you get a bunch of toys and treats in it. Which is great because they have been eating me out of house and home. Oh, literally. Stupid. Not food-wise, but treat and toy-wise. Like, they are going through toys like no tomorrow. We've got some power chewers. Oh yeah, I've got BarkBox now. I just ordered it today. They haven't even eaten the parts yet. No, but if you want, you can crack the window. Do you want to crack the window? Hopefully they like, should dissipate shortly, hopefully. Well, they're going to keep farting. Oh god, then I'm cracking the <laughs> I've got two very gassy dogs. And they're farts. Smell terrible. And it's both of them. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> On to chapter 36. Yeah, no. Dan is not gonna help. She's not. Anyways. There was such quiet beneath the waves. Even as the muffled sounds of shouting, of collision, of death echoed toward her. Aelin drifted down. As she had drifted into her power, the weight of the word key around her neck like a millstone. Deanna. She didn't know how. Didn't know why. The queen who was promised. Her lung is constricted and burned. Shock. Perhaps this was shock. Down she drifted, trying to feel her way back into her body, her mind. Salt water stung her eyes. A large, strong hand gripped the back of her collar and yanked, hauling her up in tugs, in steady strokes. What had she done? What had she done? What had she done? Light and air shattered around her, and that hand grasping her collar, now banded around her chest, tugging her against a hard male body, keeping her head above the roiling waves. I've got you, said a voice that was not Rowan's. Others. There had been others on the ship, and she has had as good as killed them all. Majesty, the male said, a question in quiet order. Fenris, that was his name. She blinked, and her name, her title, her gutted power came thrashing back into her. The sea and the battle and the threat of Morath swarming. Later. Later she'd deal with that rutting goddess who had thought to use her like some temple priestess. Later she'd contemplate how she'd shred through every world to find Deanna and make her pay. Hold on, Fenris said over the chaos now filtering in. The screaming of men. The groaning of breaking things. The crackle of flames. Don't let go. Before she could remember how to speak, they vanished into nothing, into darkness that was both solid and insubstantial as it squeezed her tightly. Then they were in the water again, 
bobbing beneath the waves as she reoriented herself and sputtered for air. He'd moved them, somehow, jumped between distances, judging by the wholly different flotsam spinning around them. Fenris held her against him, his panting labored, as if whatever magic he possessed to leap between short distances took everything he had. He sucked in a deep breath. Then they were gone again, into that dark, hollow, yet squeezing space. Only a handful of heartbeats passed before the water and sky returned. Fenris grunted, arm tightening around her as he swam with the other toward the shore, shoving aside debris. His breathing was a wet rasp now. Whatever that magic was, it was spent. But Rowan, where was Rowan? She made a sound that might have been his name, might have been a sob. Fenris panted. He's on the reef. He's fine. She didn't believe him, thrashing against the fey warrior's arm, arm until he released her. She slid into the cold, open water and twisted toward where Fenris had been headed. Another small sound cracked from her as she beheld Rowan standing knee-deep in water atop the reef. His arm was already outstretched, even though thirty yards still separated them. Fine. Unscathed. Alive. And an equally soaked Gavriel stood beside him, facing. Oh, gods. Oh, gods. Blood stained the water. There were bodies everywhere. And Morath's fleet? Most of it was gone. Nothing more than black wood splintered across the archipelago and burning bits of canvas and rope. But three ships remained. Three ships now converging on the ruins of the sea dragon as it took on water, looming like thunderclouds. You have to swim, Fenris growled beside her, his sodden golden hair plastered to his head. Right now, as fast as you can. She whipped her head toward him, blinking away burning seawater. Swim now, Fenris snapped, canines flashing. And she didn't let herself consider what was prowling beneath them as he grabbed her collar again and practically threw her ahead of him. Aelin didn't wait. She focused on Rowan's outstretched hand as she swam, his face so carefully calm, the commander on a battlefield. Her magic was barren. Her magic was a wasteland. And his? She had stolen his power from him. Think of that later. Aelin shoved through and ducked under larger bits of debris, past... past men. Rolf's men, dead in the water. Was the captain among them somewhere? She likely killed her first and only human ally in this war, and her only direct path to that lock. And if news of the former spread... Faster! Fenris barked. Rowan sheathed his sword, his knees bent. Then he was swimming to her, fast and smooth, cutting between and beneath the waves, the water seeming to part for him. She wanted to growl she could make it herself, but he reached her, saying nothing before he slipped behind her, guarding with Fenris. And what could he do in the water with no magic, against a gaping maw of a sea wyvern? She ignored the crushing tightness in her chest and hurtled for the reef, Gavriel now waiting where Rowan had been. Beneath her, the shelf of the coral at last spread, and she nearly sobbed, her muscles trembling as Gavriel crouched so she could reach his outstretched hand. The lion easily hauled her out of the water. Her knees buckled as her boots steadied on the uneven coral heads. But Gavriel kept his grip on her, subtly letting her lean against him. Rowan and Fenris were out a heartbeat later, and the prince instantly was there, hands on her face, slicking back her soaked hair, scanning her eyes. I'm fine, she rasped, her voice hoarse, from the magic, or the goddess, or the salt water she'd swallowed. I'm me. That was good enough for Rowan, who faced the three ships now bearing down on them. On her other side, Fenris had doubled over, hands on his knees as he panted. He lifted his head at her gaze, hair dripping, but said to Rowan, I'm out. We'll have to either wait for it to replenish or swim to shore. Rowan gave him a sharp nod that Aelin interpreted as understanding and thanks, and she glanced behind them. The reef seemed to be an extension of the black, rocky shore far behind, but with the tide out, they'd indeed have to swim in spots. 
have to risk what was beneath the water. Beneath the water, with Lysandra. There was no sign of wyvern or dragon. Elin didn't know if it, that was a good or bad thing. Aelin and the Fey males had made it to the reef and now stood knee-deep in water atop it. Whatever had happened, it had gone horribly wrong. So wrong that Lysandra could have sworn the feral, wild presence, who had never once forgotten her, had ducked into her long shadow as the world above exploded. She'd tumbled off the coral, the current cleaving and eddying. Wood and rope and canvas rained onto the surface, some plunging deep, then bodies and arms and legs. But there were the captain and his first mate thrashing against the flotsam that tangled them, trying to drag them down to the sandy floor. Shaking off her shock, Lysandra swept for them both. Rolf and his man froze at her approach, reaching for weapons at their sides beneath the waves, but she ripped away the debris, surely drowning them, and then let herself go still. Let them grab on to her. She didn't have much time. Rolf and his first mate latched onto her legs, clinging like barnacles as she propelled them through the water, past the now scorched ruin. The work of a minute had her depositing them onto a rocky shelf, and the emerged only and she emerged only long enough to gulp down a breath before diving. There were more men struggling in the water. She aimed for them, dodging debris until blood laced the current, and not the puffs that had been staining the water since the ship exploded. Great, roiling clouds of blood, as if massive jaws clamped around a body and squeezed. Lysandra launched forward, mighty tail snapping back and forth, body undulating, racing for the three boats bearing down on the survivors. She had to act now, while the wyverns were distracted with gutting, glutting themselves. The stench of the black boat reached her even under the waves, as if the dark wood had been soaked in rotted blood. And as she approached the closest ship's fat underbelly, two mighty shapes took farm out in the blue. Lysandra felt their attention lock on her the moment she slammed her tail into the hull. Once. Twice. Wood cracked. Muffled shouts reached her from above. She drifted back, coiling, and slammed her tail into the hull a third time. Wood tore and ripped into her, peeling away scales. But the damage was done. Water sucked in past her, more and more, tearing through the wood as its death wound grew and grew. She backtracked out of the water's pull, flipping down, 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 as the two wyverns feasting on frantic men paused. Lysandra raced for the next ship. Get the ship sinking, then their allies could pick off the struggling soldiers one by one as they swam to shore. The second ship was wiser. Spears and arrows whizzed through the water, lancing for her. She dove to the sandy floor, then shot up, 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 aiming for the vulnerable belly of the ship, body bracing for impact. She didn't reach the ship before another impact came. Faster than she could sense, slipping around the side of the ship, the sea wyvern slammed into her. Talons tore and sliced, and she flipped on instinct, whipping her tail so hard that the wyvern went tumbling out into the water. Lysandra lunged back, getting an eyeful of it as it stared her down. Oh, gods. It was nearly double her size, made of the deepest blue, its underside white and speckled with paler blue. The body was almost serpentine, wings like little more than fins along its sides. But not for speed or cruising through oceans, but, but for the long, curving talons. For the maw that was now open, tasting the blood and salt and scent of her, revealing teeth as narrow and sharp as an eel's hooked teeth, for clamping down and shredding. Behind the wyvern, the other fell into formation. Men were splashing and screaming above her, and she did not get to those get those enemy ships down. Lysandra tucked her wings in tight. She wished she had taken a bigger gulp of air, had filled these lungs to capacity. Fanning her tail in the current, she let the blood still leaking from where the ship's wood had pierced her hide drift to them. She knew the move moment it reached the wyverns. The moment they realized she was not just an ordinary animal. And then Lysandra dove. Fast and smooth, she plunged into the deep. If they had been bred for brute killing, then she'd use speed. Lysandra swept beneath them, passing under their dark shadows before they could so much as pivot. 
toward the open ocean. Come on, come on, come on. Like hounds after a hare, they gave chase. There was a sandbar flanked by reefs just to the north. She aimed for it, swimming like hell. One of the wyverns was faster than the other, swift enough that its snapping maw rippled the water at her tail. The water became clearer, brighter. Lysandra shot straight for the reef looming up out of the deep, a pillar of life and activity gone still. She curved around the sandbar. The other wyvern appeared in front of her, the second still close on her tail. Clever things. But Lysandra threw herself to the side, into the shallows of the sandbar, and let mom momentum flip her over and over, closer and closer to that narrow spit of sand. She dug her claws in deep, slowing to a stop, sand spraying and crusting her, and had her tail lifted, her body so much heavier out of the water. The wyvern that had thought to catch her off guard by swimming around the other way launched itself out of the water and onto the sandbar. She struck, fast as an asp. Its neck exposed, she clamped her jaws around it and bit down. It buckled, tail slashing, but she slammed her own into its spine, cracking its back as she cracked its neck. Black blood that tasted of rancid meat flooded her throat. Dropping the dead wyvern, she scanned the turquoise sea, the flotsam, the two remaining ships and harbor. Where was the second wyvern? Where the hell was it? Clever enough, she realized, to know when death was upon it, to seek an easier quarry. For that was a spiked dorsal fin now submerging, heading toward... Toward where Aelin, Rowan, Gavriel, and Fenris stood atop the reef, swords out, surrounded by water on all sides. Lysandra plunged into the waves, sand and blood washing away. One more, just one more wyvern, then she could wreck the boats. The remaining wyvern reached the coral outcropping, gathering speed as if it leaped from the water and swallowed the queen down whole. It didn't get within twenty feet of the surface. Lysandra hurled into it, both of them hitting the coral so hard it shuddered beneath them. But her claws were in its spine, her mouth around the back of its neck, shaking, yielding wholly to the song of survival, to the screaming demands of this body to kill, kill, kill. They tumbled into the open water. The wyvern still fighting, her grip on its neck loosening. No! A warship loomed overhead, and Lysandra dug down deep, rallying her strength one last time as she spread those wings and flapped up. She slammed the sea wyvern into the hull of the boat now above them. The beast roared its fury. She slammed it again, and again. The hull snapped, and so did the sea wyvern's body. She watched the beast go limp. Watched the water rush into the cleaved belly of the ship. Listened to the soldiers aboard begin shouting. She eased her claws from the beast and let it drift to the bottom of the sea. One more ship. Just one more. She was so tired. Shifting afterward might not even be possible for a few hours. Lysandra broke the surface, drawing down air, bracing herself. Aelin's screaming hit her before she could submerge again. Not in pain, but in one, but in warning. One word, over and over. One word for her. Swim. Lysandra craned her head toward where the queen stood atop the reef, but Aelin was pointing behind Lysandra. Not at the remaining ship, but the open water. Where three massive forms raged through the waves, aiming right for her. And that was chapter 36. This was like edge of your seat in Paris. Mm-hmm. I did not refill my water bottle before we started, so I might run out of water at some point. I can let you go. I'm not out yet, but I'll let you go. You're not here by yourself this time. I sometimes forget that. It's been a while. I know, I should have missed it. On to chapter 37. Adian's queen was on the reef, Rowan beside her, his father and Fenris flanking them. Rolf and most of his men had made it to the opposite side of the narrow bay mouth atop the reef there, and through the channel between them, one warship, one sea dragon. 
and three sea wyverns. Adult sea wyverns. The first two. They hadn't been full grown. Oh shit, the sentry beside Adian on the watchtower began chanting. Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. The sea wyverns that, Rolf had claimed, would go to the ends of the earth to slaughter whoever killed their offspring. Only being in the heart of the continent might save you. But even then, waterways would never be safe. And Lysandra had just killed two. It seemed they had not come alone. And from the cheering of the Volg soldiers on that remaining warship, it had been a trap. The offspring had been the bait. They had been only slightly bigger than Lysandra. The adults, the bulls, were thrice her size. Longer than the warship now sitting there, archers firing at the m men trying to swim ashore in the channel that had become a death trap for the green sea dragon. The green sea dragon who now stood between the three monstrous creatures and his queen, stranded on those rocks with not an, even an ember of magic left in her veins. His queen screaming over and over and over at Lysandra to swim, to shift, to run. But Adian had seen Lysandra take on the two offspring. By the second, she'd been lagging. And he'd seen her change shape so often these past months to know she couldn't shift fast enough now. Perhaps might have enough strength left to do it at all. She was stranded in her form, as surely as his companions were stuck on the reef. And if Lysandra even tried to climb onto shore, he knew the bulls would reach for her, reach her before she could so much as haul her body out of the shallows. Faster and faster those three bulls closed in. Lysandra remained at the mouth of the bay, holding the line. Adian's heart stopped. She's dead, one of the sentries hissed. Oh gods, she's dead. Shut your running mouth, Adian snarled scanning the bay, slipping into that cold, calculating place that allowed him to make decisions in battle, to weigh the costs and risks. Dorian, however, got the idea before he did. Across the bay, hand uplifted and flickering bright as a star, Dorian signaled Lysandra again and again with his power. Come to me. Come to me. Come to me, the king seemed to call. The three bulls sank beneath the waves. Lysandra turned, plunging down, but not toward Dorian. Aelin stopped shouting, and Dorian's magic winked out. Aiden could only watch as the shapeshifter shadow soared toward the three bulls, meeting them head on. The three wyverns spread out, so huge Aiden's throat went dry, and for the first time, he hated his cousin. He hated Aelin for asking this of Lysandra, both to defend them and to secure the Mycenaeans to fight for Terrison. Hated the people who had left such scars on the shifter that Lysandra was so willing to throw her life away. Hated. Hated himself for being stuck in this useless tower with a war machine only capable of firing one shot at a time. Lysandra aimed for the wyvern in the middle, and when only a hundred yards separated them, she veered left. They broke formation, one diving low, one keeping to the surface, and the other falling back. They were going to herd her. Herd her to a spot where they'd surround her from every angle and they'd rip her to shreds. It would be messy and vicious. But Lysander shot across the channel, headed. Headed right for the final remaining warship. Arrows rained down on her. Blood bloomed as some found their mark through the, her jade scales. She kept swimming, her blood sending the bull closest to her, the one near the surface, into a frenzy, pushing himself faster to grab her, bite her. Lysandra neared the ship, taking arrow after arrow, and leapt out of the water. She crashed into the soldiers in wood and the mast, rolling, writhing, and bucking, the twin masts snapping under her tail. She hit the other side, flipping down into the water, Red blood shining everywhere, just as the wyvern on her ass leaped into the sh onto the ship in a mighty arc that took Adian's breath away, but with the jagged stumps of the masts jutting up like lances. The bull landed atop them with a crunch that Adian heard across the bay. He bucked, but that was good wood now piercing through his back. And beneath his enormous weight, the ship began to crack and sink. 
Lysandra wasted no time in getting clear, and Adian could barely draw a breath as she shot across the bay again, the two bulls so horribly close that their wakes merged. One dove, the depth swallowing him from sight, but the second one still on her tail. Lysandra led that one right into Dorian's range. She drew in as close to the shore and looming tower as she could get, bringing the second bull with her. The king stretched out both hands. The bull raged past, only to halt as ice lashed across the water. Solid ice, such as there had never been here. The central sentries beside Adian fell silent. The bull roared, trying to wrest himself free, but the king's ice grew thicker, trapping the wither wyvern within its frozen grip. When the beast stopped moving, hoarfrost-like scales covered him from snout to tail. Dorian loosed a battle cry, and Adian had to admit the king wasn't that useless after all, as the catapult behind Dorian sprang free, and a rock the size of a wagon jettisoned into the bay right atop the frozen wyvern. Rock met ice and flesh, and the wyvern shattered into a thousand pieces. Rolf and some of his men were cheering. People were cheering from the docks and town. But there was one bull left in the harbor, and Lysandra was... She had no idea where the bull was. The long green body thrashed in the water, dipping beneath the waves, near frantic. Adian scanned the bay, rotating in the gunner chair as he did, searching for any hit of that colossal dark shadow. Your left! Gabriel roared across the bay, magic no doubt amplifying his voice. Lysandra twisted, and there the bull was, speeding out of the depths as if it, he were a shark ambushing prey. Lysandra threw herself into movement. A field of floating debris lay around her, the sinking ships of their enemy like islands of death, and there was the chain. If she could maybe get on it and climb high... No. She was too heavy. Too slow. She again streaked past Dorian's tower, but the bull wouldn't get near. He knew doom awaited him there. He kept just out of range, playing with her as she launched back into the field of debris between the enemy ships. Toward the open sea. Aelin and the others watched helplessly from the reef outcropping as the two monsters swept by the bull sending bits of broken hulls and masts into the air, aiming at the shifter. One struck Lysandra in the side, and she went down. Adian shot out of his seat, a roar on his lips, but there she was, blood streaming from her as she swam and swam, and she led that bull through the heart of debris, then cut back sharply. The bull followed through the blood, clouding, clouding the water, blasting through debris as she nimbly dodged. She'd worked him into a blood frenzy. And Lysandra, damn her, led him to the remnants of enemy ships, where Vogue soldiers were trying to save themselves. The bull exploded through soldier and wood as if they were veils of gossamer, leaping through the water, twining around the debris and coral and bodies. The sunlight glinting on green scales and ruby blood, Lysandra led the bull into a dance of death. Each movement slower as more of her blood leaked into the water. And then... She changed course, heading into the bay, to the chain, and cut north toward him. Aiden examined the massive bolt before him. Three hundred yards of open water separated her from the range of his arrow. Swim! Aiden roared, even if she couldn't hear. Swim, Lysandra! She fell, silence fell across the entirety of Skull's Bay as that jade sea dragon swam for her life. The bull gained on her diving down. Lysandra passed under the links of the chain and the shadow of the bull spread beneath her. So small. She was so small compared to him. One bite was all it would take. Adian slammed himself back into the gunner chair, gripping the levers and pivoting the machine as she swam and swam for him. One shot. That was all he'd have. One god's damned shot. Lysandra hurled herself forward, and Adian knew she was aware of the death that loomed, knew she was pushing that sea dragon's heart to near stopping, knew that the bull had reached the bottom and now launched himself up, up, up toward her vulnerable belly. Only a few more yards, only a few more heartbeats. Sweat slid down Adian's brow, his own heart hammering so violently all he could hear was its thunder. He shifted the spear. Slightly, 
adjusting his aim. The bull raged up from the deep, maw open, ready to rip her in half with one blow. Lysandra passed into rage and leapt, leapt clean out of the water, all sparkling scales and blood. The bull jumped with her, water streaming from his open jaws as they arced up. Adian fired, slamming his palms into the lever. Lysandra's long body arced away from those jaws as the bull lifted clean out of the water, bearing his white throat, as Adian's massive spear went clean through it. Blood spurted from the open jaws, and the creature's eyes went wide as he reared back. Lysandra slammed into the water, sending a plume so high it blocked out the sight of both of them as they crashed into the sea. When it subsided, there was only the shadow of them, and a growing pool of black blood. You! You! the sentry babbled. Load another one, he ordered, standing from his seat to scan the bubbling water. Where was she? Where was she? Aelin had perched on Rowan's shoulder, scanning the bay. And then a green head shot from the water, black blood spraying like spindrift as she hurled the severed head of the bull across the waves. Cheering. Riotous, wild cheering exploded from every corner of the bay. But Aideen was already up and running, half leaping down the stairs that would take him toward the beach that Lysandra now swam for, her own blood replacing the black ichor that stained the water. So slow. Each of her movements was so painfully slow. She lost track of her. He lost track of her as he descended below the tree line, his chest heaving. Roots and stones wrenched at him, but his face swift feet flew over the loam until it turned to sand, until light broke through the trees, and there she was, sprawled on the bleach, on the beach, bleeding everywhere. Beyond them, out in the bay, ship breaker dropped low, and Rolf's feet, fleet sweep swept out to pick off the surviving soldiers, and save any of their own still out there. He vaguely noted Aelin and the others diving into the sea, swimming hard for land. Adian dropped to his knees, wincing as sand sprayed onto her. Her scaled head was nearly as big as he was, but her eyes, those green eyes, the same color as her scales, full of pain and exhaustion. He lifted a hand toward her, but she showed her teeth, a low snarl slipping out of her. He held up his hand, scooting back. It was not the woman who looked at him, but the beast she'd become, as if she had given herself so fully to its instincts that it had been the only way to sur survive. There were gashes and slices everywhere, all dribbling blood soaking the white sand. Rowan and Aelin, one of them could help, if they could summon any power after what the queen had done. Lysandra closed her eyes, her breathing shallow. Open your god's damned eyes, Adian snarled. She snarled back, but cracked open an eye. You made it this far. Don't die on the rutting beach. The eye narrowed, with a hint of female temper. He had to get the woman back. Let her take control. Or else the beast would never allow them near enough to help. You can thank me when your sorry ass is healed. Again, that eye watched him warily temper flickering, but an animal remained. Adian drawled, even as his relief began to crumble his mask of arrogant cal calmness. The useless sentries in the watchtower are, are now all half in love with you, he lied. One said he wanted to marry you. A low snarl. He yielded a foot, but held eye contact with her as he grinned. But you know what I told them? I said they didn't stand a chance in hell. Adian lowered his voice, holding her pained, exhausted stare. Because I am going to marry you, he promised her. One day, I am going to marry you. I'll be generous and let you pick when, even if it's ten years from now, or twenty. But one day, you are going to be my wife. Those eyes narrowed, in what he could only call female outrage and exasperation. He shrugged. Princess Lysandra Ashriver sounds nice, doesn't it? And then the dragon huffed, in amusement. Exhaustion, but amusement. She opened her jaws as if she tried to speak, but realized she couldn't in this body. Blood leaked through her enormous teeth, and she shuddered in pain. Brush snapped and crashed, and there were Aelin and Rowan, and his father and Fenris. 
all of them soaked, covered in sand, and gray as death. His queen staggered for Lysandra with a sob, flinging herself onto the sand before Adian could bark a warning. But Lysandra only winced as the queen laid a hand on her, saying over and over, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Fenris and Gavriel, who had maybe saved her life with that amplified shout about the bull's location, lingered near the tree line as Rowan approached, surveying the wounds. Fenris spotted Adian's glance, spotted the warning wrath on his face if either of them got near the shifter and said, That was one hell of a shot, boyo. His father nodded in agreement. Adian ignored them both. Whatever well of magic his cousin and Rowan had depleted was already refilling. The shifter's wounds knitted closed, one by one. Slowly, painfully slowly, but the bleeding stopped. She lost a lot of blood, Rowan observed to none of them in particular. Too much. I've never seen anything like that in my life, Fenris murmured. None of them had. Aelin was trembling, a hand on her friend's face so white and drawn that any harsh words he'd reserved for her were unnecessary. His queen knew the cost. It had taken her so damn long to trust any of them to do anything. If Adian roared at her now, even if he still yearned to, Aelin might never delegate again. Because if Lysandra hadn't been in the water when things had gone so, so badly. What happened? He breathed, catching Aelin's eye. What the hell happened out there? I lost control, Aelin said hoarsely, as if she couldn't help it. Her hand drifted to her chest, where, through the white of her shirt, he could make out the amulet of Orinth. He knew then, knew precisely what Aelin carried. What would have snagged Rolf's interest on the map of his, similar enough to the Vogue essence, to get him to come running. Knew why it had been so important, so vital she risked everything to get it from Arab and Hamel. Knew that she had used a word key today, and it had almost killed them all. She was shaking now, that rage indeed taking over. But Rowan snarled at him, low and vicious. Save it for later. Because Fenris and Gavriel had tensed, watching. Adian growled right back at him. Rowan gave him a cold, steady look that, if said, that said if he so much as began to hint at what their queen carried, he'd rip out his tongue. Literally. Adian shoved down the anger. We can't carry her, and she's too weak to shift. Then we wait here until she can, Aelin said. But her eyes drifted to the bay, where Rolf was now being helped onto those rescue ships, and to the city beyond, still cheering. A victory, but very nearly a loss. The remnants of the Mycenaeans saved by one of their long-lost sea dragons. Aelin Lysandra had woven ancient prophecies into tangible fact. I'll stay. Adian said. You deal with Rolf. His father offered from behind him. I can get some supplies from the watchtower. Fine, he said. Aelin groaned, getting to her feet, but stared down at him before she took Rowan's extended hand. She said softly, I'm sorry. Adian knew she meant it. He still didn't bother replying. Lysandra groaned, the reverberations running up his knees and straight into his gut, and Adian whirled back to the shifter. Aelin left without further goodbye. The lion lingered in the brush, keeping out of sight and sound as the wolf watched over the dragon still sprawled across the beach. For hours, the wolf remained there, while the outgoing tide cleared the harbor of blood, while the pirate lord's ships sent any remaining enemies bodies into the crushing blue, while the young queen returned to the city in the heart of the bay to handle any fallout. Once the sun had begun to set, the dragon stirred, and slowly, her form shimmering and shrinking, scales were smoothed into skin, a snout melted back into a flawless human face, and stumpy limbs lengthened into golden legs. Sand crusted her naked body, and she tried and failed to rise. The wolf moved then, slinging his cloak around her and sweeping her into his arms. The shifter didn't object, and her eyes were again closed by the time the wolf began striding up the beach to the trees, her head leaning against his chest. 
the lion remained out of sight and held in the offer to help. Held in the words he needed to say to the wolf, who had downed a sea wyvern with one arrow. Twenty-four years old and already a myth whispered over campfires. Today's events would no doubt be told around fires and lands even the lion had not roamed in all his centuries. The lion watched the wolf vanish into the trees, heading for the town at the end of the sandy road, the shifter unconscious in his arms. And the lion wondered if he himself would ever be mentioned in those whispered stories, if his son would ever allow the world to know who had sired him, or even care. And that was chapter 37. Oh, stretch break. Ooh. Again? I had coffee. I've been but drinking coffee before a reading stream. I thought I had time to get it all out before I came here, but then I had to come early. And, and... anyway, um, so I'm going to do that, and, and then I'm going to refill your water. Well, I'll refill your water first. Okay. Um, probably step outside for a second so go ahead and read i'll just turn my volume up a little bit so i'm hearing you through my phone mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but i shall take care of you first thank you let me um sorry i'm just quickly paging through this chapter Um, okay, so I'm going to put a content warning in the beginning of this chapter, because paging through it, as I remember, the one, there's like, there's like one, like, this is the most detailed sex scene is coming up in this chapter. So this is your content warning. It is coming up in this chapter. Um, there is one more sexual scene left in the entire series, I think. Um, and that one's in Tower of Dawn. But yeah, the main one, the main one that's mostly the most detailed one is coming up in this chapter. So this is everybody's content warning. I will try to give another one right before it happens, but I might just be in the zone of reading. So this is your content warning now that in the middle to end of this chapter, there's a sexual scene coming up. That is your warning. <clears throat> okay. Again, sexual scene, content warning. This is your warning. If you do not want to listen to that, then you're going to have to miss a chapter of the book. But just be prepared. Sexual scene coming up in this chapter. Chapter 38. The meeting with Rolf once the harbor was again safe was quick. Frank. And Aelin knew if she didn't get the hell out of this city for an hour or two, she might very well explode again. Every key has a lock, Deanna had said, a little reminder of Brandon's order, using her voice, and had called her that title. That title that struck some chord of horror and understanding in her. So, so deep, she was still working out what it meant. The queen who was promised. Aelin stormed out, stormed onto a spit of beach on the far side of the island, having run here, needing to get her blood roaring, needing it to silence the thoughts in her head. Behind her, Rowan's steps were quiet as death. Only the two of them had been in that meeting with Rolf. Bloodied, soaked, the pirate lord had met them in the main room of his inn. The name of it now a permanent reminder of the ship she'd wrecked, he demanded. What the hell happened? And she had been so tired, so pissed off and full of disgust and despair that it had been nearly impossible to muster the swagger. 
when you are blessed by Mala, you find that sometimes your control can slip. Slip. I don't know what you fools were talking about down there, but from what I was standing, it looked like you lost your god's damned mind and were about to fire on my town. Rowan, leaning against the edge of a nearby table, explained, Magic is a living thing. When you are that deep in it, remembering yourself, your purpose, is an effort. That my queen did so before it was too late is a feat in itself. Rolf wasn't impressed. It looks like to me like you were a little girl playing with a power too big for you to handle, and only your prince jumping in your path made you decide not to slaughter my innocent people. Aelin closed her eyes for a heartbeat. The image of Rowan leaping in front of that fist of moonfire flashing before her. When she opened her eyes, she let the crackling assuredness fade into something frozen and hard. It looks to me, she said, like the pirate lord of Skull's Bay and long-lost Mycenaean heir has just allied with a young queen so powerful she can decimate cities if she wishes. It looks to me like you have made yourself untouchable with that alliance. And any fool who seeks to harm you, usurp you, will have me to contend with. So I suggest you salvage what you can of your precious ship, mourn the dozen men I take full responsibility for losing, and whose families I will compensate accordingly, and shut your rutting mouth. She turned toward the door, exhaustion and rage nipping at her bones. Rolf said to her back, Don't you want, do you want to know what the cost of this map was? She halted, Rowan glancing between them, face unreadable. She smirked over her shoulder. Your soul? Rolf let out a hoarse laugh. Yes, in a way. When I was sixteen, I was barely more than a slave on one of those festering ships. My Mycenaean's heritage, just a one-way ticket to a beating. He laid a tattooed hand on the thresher lettering. Every coin I earned came back here. To my mother and sister, and one day the ship I was on got caught in a storm. The captain was a haughty bastard, refused to find safe harbor, and the ship was destroyed. Most of the crew drowned. I drifted for a day, washed up on an island at the edge of the archipelago, and awoke to find a man staring down at me. I asked if I was dead, and he laughed and inquired what I wanted for myself. I was so delirious I told him I wanted to be captain. I wanted to be pirate lord of Skull's Bay and make the arrogant fools like the captain who had killed my friends bow before me. I thought I was dreaming when he explained that if he were to grant me the skills to do it, there would be a price. What I value most in the world, he would have. I said I'd pay it. Whatever it was. I had no belongings, no wealth, no people anyway. A few coppers would be nothing. He smiled before he vanished into sea mist. I awoke with the ink on my hands. Aelin waited. Rolf shrugged. I made it back here, finding friendly ships using the map the stranger had inked there. A gift from a god, or so I thought. But it wasn't until I saw the black sheets over my cottage windows that I had began to worry. And it wasn't until I learned that my mother and sister had used their little money to hire a skiff to go looking for me that the s and that that skiff had returned to harbor, but they had not, that I realized the price I had handed over. That's what the sea claimed, what he claimed. And it made me soulless enough that I lose myself upon this city, this archipelago. Rolf's green eyes were as merciless as the sea god who had gifted and damned him. That was the price of my power. What shall yours be, Aelin Galathinius? She didn't reply to him before storming out, though Deanna's voice had echoed in her mind. The queen, who was promised. Now, standing on that empty beach and monitoring the glimmering expanse of the sea, as the last of the sun vanished, Rowan said beside her, Did you willingly use the key? No hint of judgment, of con condemnation, just curiosity and concern, Aelin rasped. No, I don't know what happened. One minute it was us, then she came. She rubbed at her chest, avoiding the touch of the golden chain against it. Her throat tightened as she took in the, that spot on his own chest, right between his pectorals, where, his, where her fist had been aimed. 
How could you? She breathed, a tremor running through her. How could you put yourself in front of me like that? Roman took a step closer, but no farther. The crashing of waves and cries of gulls heading home for the night filled the space between them. If you had destroyed that city, it would have destroyed you and any sort of hope at an alliance. Shaking began in her hands, spreading to her arms, her chest, her knees. Flame and ash curled on her tongue. If I had killed you, she hissed, but choked on the words, unable to finish the thought, the idea of it. Her throat burned, and she squeezed her eyes shut, warm flames rippling around her. I thought I'd found the bottom of my power, she admitted, magic already overflowing. So soon, too soon after she'd had emptied herself. I thought what I found in Wendelin was the bottom. I had no idea it was all just an antechamber. Aelin lifted her hands, opening her eyes to find her fingers wreathed in flame. Darkness spread over the world, through the veil of gold and blue and red. She looked at her prince. She raised her burning hands helplessly between them. She stole me. She took me. And I could feel her, feel her consciousness. It was like she was a spider waiting in a web for decades, knowing I'd one day be strong and stupid enough to use my magic and the key together. I might as well have rung the dinner bell. Her fire burned hotter, brighter, and she let it build and rise and flicker. A wry, bitter smile. It seems she wants us to make finding this lack a priority, if you were given the message. Twice. Indeed. Isn't it enough to contend with Erwan and Maeve? To do the bidding of Brannon and Elena? Now I have to face the gods breathing down my neck about it as well? Perhaps it was a warning. Perhaps Deanna wished to show you how a not-so-friendly god might use you if you're not careful. She enjoyed every running second of it. She wanted to see what my power might do. What she could do with my body. With the key. Her flames burned hotter, shredding through her clothes until they were ash. Until she was naked and clothed in only her fire. And what she called me? The queen who was promised? Promised when? To whom? To do what? I've never heard that phrase in my life, not even before Terrison fell. We'll figure it out. And that was that. How can you be so fine with this? Embers sprayed from her like a swarm of fireflies. Rowan's mouth tightened. Trust me, Aelin. I am anything but fine with the idea that you are fair game to those immortal bastards. I am anything but fine with the idea that you could be taken from me like that. If I could, I would hunt Deanna down and pay her back for it. She's the goddess of the hunt. You might be a bit, you might be at a disadvantage. Her flames eased a bit. A half smile. She's a haughty immortal. She's bound to slip up. And besides, a shrug, I have her sister on my side. He angled his head, studying her face, her fire. Perhaps that's why Mala appeared to me that morning, why she gave me her blessing. Because you're the only one arrogant and insane enough to hunt a goddess? Rowan shucked off his boots, tossing them onto the dry sand behind him. Because I'm the only one arrogant and insane enough to ask Mala Firebringer to let me stay with the woman I love. Her flames turned to pure gold at the words. At that word. But she said, Perhaps you're just the only one arrogant and insane enough to love me. That unreadable mask cracked. This new depth to your power, Aelin, changes nothing. What Deanna did changes nothing. You are still young. Your power is still growing. And if this new well of power gives us even the slightest advantage against Erewhon, then thank the rutting darkness for it. But you and I will learn to manage your power together. You do not face this alone. You do not decide that you are unlovable because you have powers that can save and destroy. If you start to resent that power... He shook his head. I do not think we will win this war if you start down that road. Aelin strode into the lapping waves and sank to her knees in the surf, steam rising around her in great plumes. Sometimes, 
she admitted over the hissing water. I wish someone else could fight this war. Rowan stepped into the bubbling surf, his magic shielding against the heat of her. Ah, he said, kneeling beside her as she still gazed out over the dark sea. But who else would be able to get under Erewhon's skin? Never underestimate the power of that insufferable swagger. She chuckled, starting to feel the cool kiss of the water on her naked body. As far as memory serves, Prince, it was that insufferable swagger that won your cranky, immortal heart. Rowan leaned into the thin veil of flame now melting into night's sweet air and nipped her lower lip. A sharp, wicked bite. There's my fire heart. Eowyn let him pivot her in the surf and sand to face him fully. Let him slide his mouth along her jaw, the curve of her cheekbone, the point of her fey ear. These, he said, nibbling at her earlobe, have been tempting me for months. His tongue traced the delicate tip, and her back arched. The strong hands at her hips tightened. Sometimes you'd be sleeping beside me at Mistward, and it'd take all my, self, all my concentration not to lean over and bite them. Bite you all over. Hmm, she said, tipping back her head to grant him access to her neck. Rowan obliged her silent demand, pressing kisses and soft, growling nips to her throat. I've never taken a woman on a beach, he purred against her skin, sucking gently on the space between her neck and shoulder. And look at that. We're far from any sort of collateral. One hand drifted from her hip to caress the scars on her back, the other sliding to cuff her backside, drawing her fully against him. Aelin spread her hands over his chest, tugging his white shirt over his head. Warm waves crashed against them, but Rowan held her fast, unmovable, unshakable. Aelin remembered herself enough to say, Someone might come looking for us. Rowan huffed a laugh against her neck. Something tells me, he said, his breath skittering along her skin. You might not mind if we were discovered if someone saw how thoroughly I planned to worship you. She felt the words dangling there, felt herself dangling there, off the edge of a cliff. She swallowed, but Rowan had caught her each time she had fallen, first when she had plummeted into that abyss of despair and grief, second when that castle had shattered and she had plunged to the earth, and now, this time, this third time. She was not afraid. Aelin met Rowan's stare and said clearly and baldly, and without a speckle of doubt, I love you. I am in love with you, Rowan. I have been for a while, and I know there are limits to what you can give me, and I know that you might need time. His lips crushed into hers, and he said onto her mouth, dropping words more precious than rubies and emeralds and sapphires into her heart, her soul. I love you. There is no limit to what I can give to you. No time I need. Even when this world is a forgotten whisper of dust between the stars, I will love you. Aelin didn't know when she started crying, when her body began shaking with the force of it. She had never said such words. To anyone. Never let herself be that vulnerable. Never felt this burning and unending thing so consuming she might die from the force of it. Rowan pulled back wiping away her tears with his thumbs, one after another. He said softly, barely audible over the crashing waves around them. Fireheart. She sniffed back tears. Buzzard. He roared a laugh, and she let him lay her down on the sand with a gentleness near reverence. His sculpted chest heaved slightly as he ran an eye over her bare body. You are so beautiful. She knew he didn't just mean the skin and curves and bones. But Aelin still smiled, humming. I know, she said, lifting her arms above her head, setting the amulet of Orinth onto a safe, high part of the beach. Her fingers dug into the soft sand as she arced her back in a slow stretch. Rowan tracked every movement, every flicker of muscle and skin. When his gaze lingered on her breasts, gleaming with seawater, his, his expression turned ravenous. Then his gaze slid lower, lower. And when it lingered on the apex of her thighs and his eyes glazed, Aelin said to him, Are you going to stand there gawking all night? Rowan's mouth parted slightly, 
his breathing shallow, his body already showing her precisely where this was going to end. A phantom wind hissed through the palms, whispered over the sand. Her magic tingled as she felt, more than saw, Rowan's shield fall into place around them. She sent her own power tracing over it, knocking and tapping at the shield in sparks of flame. Rowan's canines gleamed. Nothing is getting past that shield, and nothing is going to hurt me, either. Something tight in her chest eased. Is it that different with someone like me? I don't know, Rowan admitted. Again, his eyes slid along her body as if he could see through the skin to her burning heart beneath. I've never been with an equal. I've never allowed myself to be that unleashed. For every bit of power she threw at him, he'd throw back at her. She braced herself on her elbows, lifting her mouth to the new scar on his shoulder, the wound small and jagged, as broad as an arrowhead. She kissed it once. Twice. Rowan's body was so tense above hers that she thought his muscles would snap, but his hands were gentle as they drifted to her back, stroking her scars and, that to and the tattoos he'd inked over them. The waves tickled and caressed her, and he made to settle over her, but she lifted a hand to his chest, halting him dead. She smiled against his mouth. If we're equals, then I don't understand why you're still half-clothed. She didn't give him the chance to explain as she traced her tongue over the seam of his lips, as her fingers unlatched the buckle of his worn sword belt. She wasn't sure he was breathing. And just to see what he'd do, she palmed him through his pants. Rowan barked a curse. She laughed quietly, kissed his newest scar again, and dragged a finger down lazily, indolently, holding his gaze for every single inch she touched. And when Aelin laid her palm flat on him again, she said, you are mine. Rowan's breathing started again, jagged and savage as the waves breaking around them. She flicked open the top button of his pants. I'm yours, he ground out. Another button popped free. And you love me, she said. Not a question. To whatever end, he breathed. She popped the third and final button free, and he let go of her to toss his pants onto the sand nearby, taking his undershorts with them. Her mouth went dry as she took in the sight of him. Rowan had been bred and honed for battle, and every inch of him was pure-blooded warrior. He was the most beautiful thing she'd ever seen. Hers. He was hers, and... You are mine, Rowan breathed, and she felt the claiming in her bones. Her soul. I am yours, she answered. And you love me. Such hope and quiet joy in his eyes beneath all that fierceness. To whatever end. For too long, for too long had he been alone and wandering. No longer. Rowan kissed her again, slow, soft. A hand slid up the pain of her torso while he lowered himself over her, his hips nestling against hers. She gasped a bit at the touch, gasped a bit more as his knuckle grazed the heavy, aching underside of her breast, as she leaned down to kiss the other. His teeth grazed over her nipple, and her, te and her eyes drifted closed, a moan slipping out of her. Oh gods, oh burning, rutting gods, Rowan knew what he was doing. He really gods damned did. His tongue flicked against her nipple, and her head tipped back, her fingers digging into his shoulders, urging him to take more, to take harder. Rowan growled his approval, her breast still in his mouth, on his tongue his hand making lazy strokes from her ribs, down her waist, down her thighs, then back up. She arced in silent demand. A phantom touch, like the northern wind-given form, flicked over her bare breast. Aelin burst into flames. Rowan laughed darkly at the reds and golds and blues that erupted around them, illuminating the palms that towered over the edge of the beach, the waves breaking behind him. She might have panicked, might have been mortified had he not lifted his mouth to hers, had those phantom hands of ice-kissed wind not kept working her breasts, had his own hand not continued stroking closer and closer to where she needed him. You're magnificent, he murmured onto her lips, his tongue sliding into her mouth. 
The hardness of him pushed against her, and she bucked her hips, needing to grind herself against him, to do anything to ease the building ache between her legs. Rowan groaned, and she wondered if there was any other male in the world who would be so naked and prone with a woman on fire, who would not look at those flames with any ounce of fear. She slid her hand between them, and when she closed her fingers around him, marveling at the velvet-wrapped steel, Rowan groaned again, pushing into her hand. She pulled from her mouth from his, staring into those pine-green eyes as she slid her hand along him. He lowered his head, not to kiss her, but to watch where she stroked him. A roaring wind full of ice and snow blasted around them, and it was her turn to huff a laugh. But Rowan gripped her wrist, drawing her hand away. She opened her mouth in protest, wanting to touch more, taste more. Let me, Rowan growled onto the sea-slick skin between her breasts. Let me touch you. His voice trembled enough that Aelin lifted his chin with her thumb and forefinger. A flicker of fear and relief shone beneath the gazed lust. As if doing this, touching her, was as much to remind him that she had made it today, that she was safe as it was to pleasure her. She leaned up, brushing her mouth against his. Do your worst, prince. Rowan's smile was nothing short of wicked as he pulled away to run a broad hand from her throat down to the juncture of her thighs. She shuddered at the sheer possession and the touch, her breath coming in tight pants as he gripped either th thigh and spread her legs, bearing her fully for him. Another wave crashed, parting around them, the cool water like a thousand kisses along her skin. Rowan kissed her navel, then her hip. Aelin couldn't take her eyes from his silver hair shining with salt water and moonlight from the hands holding her wide for him as his head dipped between her legs. And as Rowan tasted her on that beach, as he laughed against her slick skin while her hoarse cries of his name shattered across the palm trees and sand and water, Aelin let go of all pretense at reason. She moved, hips undulating, begging him to go, go, go. So Rowan did sliding a finger into her as his tongue flicked that one spot, and oh gods, she was going to explode into starfire. Aelin, he growled, her name a plea. Please, she moaned. Please. The word was his undoing. Rowan rose over her again, and she let out a sound that might have been a whimper, might have been his name. Then Rowan had a hand braced in the sand beside her head, fingers twining in her hair, while the other guided himself into her. At the first nudge of him, she forgot her own name, and as he slid in with gentle rolling thrusts, filling her inch by inch, she forgot that she was queen, and that she had a separate body and a kingdom and a world to look after. When Rowan was seated deep in her, trembling with restraint as he let her adjust, she lifted her burning hands to his face. Wind and ice tumbling and roaring around them, dancing across the waves with ribbons of flame. There were no words in his eyes. None in hers, either. Words did not do it justice, not in any language, in any world. He leaned in, claiming her mouth as, she began to, as he began to move, and they let go entirely. She might have been crying, or it might have been his tears on her face, turning to steam amid her flames. She dragged her hands down his powerful, muscled back, over scars from battles and terrors long since past. And as his thrusts turned deeper, she dug in her fingers dragging her nails across his back, claiming him, marking him. His hips slammed home at the blood she drew, and she arched, baring her throat to him. For him. Only him. Rowan's magic went wild, though his mouth on her neck was so careful, even as his canines dragged along her skin. And at the touch of those lethal teeth against her, the death that hovered nearby, and the hands that would always be gentle with her, always love her, Release blasted through her like wildfire, and though she could not remember her name, she remembered Rowan's as she cried it while he kept moving, wringing every last, last ounce of pleasure from her, fire searing the sand around them to glass. Rowan's own release barreled through him at the sight of it, and he groaned her name so that she remembered it at last, lightning joining wind and ice over the water. Aelin held him through it, sending the fire opal of her magic to twine with his power. On and on, as he spilled himself in her, lightning and flame danced on the sea. The lightning continued to strike, silent and lovely, even after he stilled. 
The sounds of the world came pouring back in, his breathing as ragged as the hiss of the crashing waves while he brushed lazy kisses to her temple, her nose, her mouth. Aelin drew her eyes away from the beauty of their magic, the beauty of them, and found his face to be the most beautiful of all. She was trembling, and so was Rowan as he remained in her. His, he buried his face in the crook of her neck and shoulder, his uneven breath warming her skin. I never, he tried, voice hoarse. I didn't know it could be. She ran her fingers down his scarred back over and over. I know, she breathed. I know. Already she wanted more. Already she was calculating how long she'd have to wait. You once told me that you don't bite the females of other males. Rowan stiffened a bit, but she went on coyly. Does that mean you'll bite your own female then? Understanding flashed in those green eyes as he raised his head from her neck to study the spot where those canines had once pierced her skin. That was the first time I really lost control around you, you know. I wanted to chuck you off a cliff, yet I bit you before I knew what I was doing. I think my body knew, my magic knew, and you tasted. Rowan loosed a jagged breath. So good I hated you for it. I couldn't stop thinking about it. I'd wake up at night with that taste on my tongue. Wake up thinking about your foul, beautiful mouth. He traced his thumb over her lips. You don't want to know the, the depraved things I've thought about this mouth. Hmm. Likewise. But you didn't answer my question, Aelin said, even as her toes curled in the wet sand and warm water. Yes, Rowan said thickly. Some males enjoy doing it. To mark territory. For pleasure. Do females bite males? He began to harden again inside her as the question lingered. Oh, gods, fey lovers, everyone should be so damn lucky to have one. Rowan rasped. Do you want to bite me? Aelin eyed his throat, his glorious body and the face that, had once so f that she had once so fiercely hated. And she wondered if it were possible to love someone enough to die from it. If it were possible to love someone enough that time and distance and death were of no concern. Am I limited to your neck? Rowan's eyes flared, and his answering thrust was answer enough. They moved together, undulating like the sea before them, and when Rowan roared her name again the star-flecked black, Aelin hoped the gods themselves heard it and knew their days were now numbered. And that was chapter 38. <clears throat> you should read uh, Sarah J. Moss's other series. Yeah. Uh-huh. Especially the, um... I'm pushing all hell in the queen. Uh, see, I don't get, like, super flustered and embarrassed with sex scenes like this. I did when I first read it, but I've read it so many times now. Like, I could probably recite it. And if you read a Court of Thorns and Roses series, specifically a Court of Silver Flames, you know what I'm talking about. That book is not appropriate to read on stream. Like, it's... It's not. <laughs> it's not. It's not. Really that bad. one, I would blush reading out loud. Not even because my mom is sitting here. I don't care that my mom hears it. We're, we're best friends. But just reading it aloud to the internet. I would blush on that because that one it is like it is like every other chapel and it is very detailed okay. like this uses veiled words like you get you get it but you are even good at the intensity of how you read it thank you i try uh, i try yeah. <clears throat> yeah okay yeah Haley gets it Haley gets it it's it is it's a really well written scene, I think. Like it's very good at describing the emotion and the feelings behind it without being vulgar about it, if that makes sense. It's, I love Sarah J. Moss. She is an amazing writer. Amazing. There's a reason she's my comfort series. <clears throat> okay. Gotta write down the time stamp. Okay. 
<clears throat> oh my gosh, it's like 10 p.m. already. Yeah. What the heck? Hold on. Let me see how long this next chapter is. Hmm. Okay, we're gonna do this next chapter because once we finish this next chapter, it's end of part one of this book and it'll go to part two. So we're just gonna do this next chapter. It's not the shortest, but I'd rather like just leave off finishing part one. <clears throat> okay, chapter 39. Roman didn't know whether to be amused, thrilled, or slightly terrified that he'd been blessed with a queen and a lover who had so little care for public decency. He'd taken her three times on that beach, twice in the sand, then a third out in the warm waters, and yet his very blood was st still electrified, yet he still wanted more. They'd swum into the shallows to wash off the sand crusted on them, but Aelin had wrapped her legs around his waist, kissed his neck, then licked his ear, and the, the way he'd nibbled hers and he was buried in her again. She knew why he needed the contact, why he'd needed to taste her on his tongue and then with the rest of his body. She'd needed the same. He still needed it. When they'd finished after the, that first time, he'd been left reeling to pull his sanity back together after the joining that had unleashed him, broken and remade him. His magic had been a song and she had been, he'd never had anything like her. Everything he'd given to her, she'd given right back to him. And when she had bit him during that second coupling in the sand, his magic had left near, had left six nearby palm trees in splinters, and he'd climaxed so hard that he thought his body would shatter. But once they were finished, when she'd actually made to walk back to Skull's Bay in nothing but her flames, he'd given her his shirt and belt, which did little to cover her up, especially those beautiful legs. But at least it was less likely to start a riot. Barely, though. And it'd be obvious what they'd done on that beach the moment they stepped within scenting rage of anyone with preternatural sense of smell. He'd marked her, richer than the scent that had clung to her before. Marked her deep and true, and there was a no undoing it, no washing it away. She'd claimed him, and he'd claimed her. And he, he knew she was well aware of what that claiming meant. Just as he knew... He knew it had been a choice on her part, a final decision regarding the matter of who would be in her royal bed. He would try to live up to that honor, try to find some way to prove he deserved it, that she hadn't bet on the wrong horse. Somehow, he'd earn it, even with so little to offer beyond his own magic and heart. Oh, it's a cat in a litter box. But he also knew his queen, and knew that despite the enormity of what they'd done, Aelin had also kept him on that beach to avoid the others, avoid answering their questions and demands. But he made it one foot inside the ocean road, Rose, saw the light in Adian's room, and knew their friends would not be so easily deterred. Why does she scream? Why does she think she's on Skull Skull? That or she just went poop on my floor. In the corner of my room. She's been doing that. And so she's probably scratching at the wall and at the lamp post right next to it to cover it. We love having animals. Um, uh, indeed, uh, uh, would not be so easily deterred. Indeed, Aelin was scowling up at the light. The worry quickly replaced it as she remembered the shifter who had been so thoroughly unconscious. Her bare feet were silent on the stairs and hallway as she hurried for the room, not bothering to knock before flinging open the door. Rowan loosed a sharp breath, trying to draw up his magic to cool the fire still in his blood. To calm the instincts roaring and raging at him. Not to take her, but to eliminate any other threat. A dangerous time for any fey male when they first took a lover. Worse when it meant something more. Dorian and Adian sat in the two armchairs before the darkened fireplace, arms crossed, and her cousin's face went pale with what might have been terror as he scented Aelin, the markings both seen and invisible on them. Lysandra sat in bed, face drawn but eyes narrow at the queen. It was the shifter who purred. Enjoy your ride? 
Adian didn't dare move and was giving Dorian a warning look to do the same. Rowan bit down against the rage at the sight of other males near his queen, reminding himself that they were his friends, but that primal, primal rage stumbled as he felt Aelin's shuddering relief upon finding the shifter mostly healed and lucid. But his queen only shrugged. Is that all fey males are good for? Rowan raised his brows, chuckling as he debated reminding her how she'd begged him throughout, how she'd said words like please and oh gods and a few extra pleases thrown in for good measure. He'd enjoy wringing those rarely seen manners from her again. Aelin shot him a glare, daring him to say it. And despite just having her, despite the fact that he could still taste her, Rowan knew that whenever they found their bed again, she would not get the rest she wanted. Color stained Aelin's cheeks, as if she saw his plans unfold. But she lifted the amulet from around her neck, dropped it onto the low-lying table between Aidan and Dorian, and said, I learned that this was the third word he when I was still in Wendelin. Silence. Then, as if she hadn't shattered any sense of safety they still possessed, Aelin withdrew the mangled eye of Elena from her pack, chucked it once in the air, and jerked her chin at the King of Adderlin. I think it's time you met your ancestor. Dorian listened to Aelin's story, about the word key she'd secretly carried, about what had happened today in the bay, about how she'd tricked Lorcan and how it would even eventually lead the warrior back to them, hopefully with the other two keys in his hands. And if they were lucky, they would have already found the, this lock. She had been ordered twice now to retrieve from the stone marshes, the only thing capable of binding the word keys back into the gate from which they'd been hewn, and ending the threat of Erewhon forever. No number of allies would make a difference if they could not stop Erewhon from using those keys to unleash the Volg hordes from his own realm upon Aurelia. His, position of, his possession of two keys had already led to such darkness. If he gained the third, gained mastery over the word gate, and could open it at, to any world at will, use it to summon any conquering army, they had to find that lock to nullify those keys. When the queen was done, Aideen was silently fuming, Lysandra was frowning, and Aelin was now snuffing out the candles in the room with hardly a wave of her hand. Two ancient tomes withdrawn from Aideen's crammed saddlebags lay open on the table. He knew those books. He had no idea she'd taken them from Rifthold. The warped metal of the Eye of Elena amulet sat atop one of them, as Aelin double-checked the markings on an age-spotted page. Darkness fell as she used her own blood to etch those markings on the wooden floor. Looks like our bill of damages to the city is going to rise, Lysandra muttered. Aelin snorted. We'll just move the rug to cover it. She finished making a mark. A word mark, Dorian realized with a chill, and stepped back, plucking the eye in her fist. Now what? Adian said. Now we keep our mouths shut, Aelin said sweetly. The moonlight spread on the floor, devoured by the dark lines she'd etched. Aelin drifted over to where Rowan sat on the edge of the bed, still shirtless thanks to the queen currently wearing his shirt, and took up a spot beside him, a hand on his knee. Lysandra was the first to notice. She sat up in the bed, green eyes glowing with animal brightness as the moonlight on the blood marks seemed to shimmer. Aelin and Rowan jerked to their feet. Dorian just stared at the marks, at the moonlight, at the beam of it shining through the open balcony doors. As if the light itself were a doorway, the shaft of moonlight turned into a humanoid figure. It flickered, its form barely there, like a figment of a dream. The hair on Dorian's arms rose, and he had the good sense to slide out of his chair and onto a knee as he bowed his head. He was the only one who did so. The only one, he realized, who had spoken to Elena's mate, Gavin, long ago. Another lifetime ago. He tried not to consider what it meant that he now carried Gavin's sword, Damaris. Aelin had not asked for it back, did not seem inclined to do so. A muffled female voice, as if it were calling from far away, flickered in and out with the image. Too far, a light young voice said. Aelin stepped forward and shut those ancient spellbooks before stacking them with a thump. Well, Rifthold isn't exactly available, and your tomb is trashed, so tough luck. 
Dorian's head lifted as he glanced between the flickering figure of moonlight and the young queen of flesh and blood. Elena's roughly formed body vanished, then reappeared, as if the wind itself disturbed her. Can't. Hold. Then I'll make it quick. Aelin's voice was sharp as a blade. No more games, no more half-truths. Why did Diana arrive today? I get it, finding the lock is important, but what is it? And tell me what she meant by calling me the queen who was promised. As if the words jolted the dead queen like lightning, his ancestor appeared, fully corporeal. She was exquisite, her face young and grave, her hair long and silvery white, like Manon's, and her eyes, startling, dazzling blue. They now fixated on him, the pale gown she wore fluttering on a phantom breeze. Rise, young king. Aelin snorted. Can we not play the holier-than-thou ancient spirit game? But Elena surveyed Rowan, Adian. Her slender fair neck bobbed, and Aelin, gods above, snapped her fingers at the queen. Once. Twice. Drawing her attention back to her. Hello, Elena, she drawled. So nice to see you. It's been a while. Care to answer some questions? Irritation flickered in the dead queen's eyes, but Elena's chin remained high, her slender shoulders back. I do not have much time. The connection is too hard to maintain so far from Rifthold. What a surprise. The two queens stared each other down. Elena, word damn him, broke first. Diana is a god. She does not have rules and morals and codes the way we do. Time does not exist for her in the way it does for us. You let your magic touch the key. The key opened a door, and Diana happened to be watching at that exact moment. That she spoke to you at all is a gift. That you managed to shove her out before she was ready. She will not forget that insult. Majesty. She can get in line, Aelin said. Elena shook her head. There is... There is so much I did not get to tell you. Like the fact that you and Gavin never killed Erewhon, lied to everyone about it, and then left him for us to deal with. Dorian risked a glance at Adian, but his face was hard, calculated. Ever the general fixed on the dead queen now standing in this room with them. Lysandra. Lysandra was gone. No. In ghost leopard form, slinking through the shadows. Rowan's hand was resting casually on his sword. Though Dorian's own magic swept the room and realized the weapon was to be the physical distraction, from the magical blow he'd deal Elena if he so much as looked funny at Aelin. Indeed, a hard shield of air now lay between the two queens, and sealed this room, too. Elena shook her head, her silver hair flowing. You were meant to retrieve the word keys before Erewhon could get this far. Well, I didn't. Aelin snapped. Forgive me if you weren't entirely clear on your directions. Elena said. I do not have time to explain, but know it was the only choice to save us, to save Aurelia. It was the only choice I could make. And for all their snapping at each other, the queen exposed her palms to Aelin. Deanna and my father spoke true. I thought, I thought it was broken, but if they told you to find the lock... She bit her lip. Aelin said. Brandon said to go to the stone marshes of Eelway to find the lock. Where, precisely, in the marshes? There was once a great city in the heart of the marshes, Elena breathed. It is now half drowned on the plain. In a temple at its center, we laid the remnants of the lock. I didn't. My father retained the lock at terrible cost. The cost of my mother's body, her mortal life. A lock for the word keys. To seal shut the gate and bind the keys inside them forever. I did not understand what it had been intended for. My father never told me about any of it until it was too late. And I knew, all I knew was the lock was only to be used once. Its power capable of sealing anything we wished. So I stole it. I used it for myself, for my people. I have been paying for that crime since. You used it to seal Erewhon in his tomb. Aelin said quietly. The pleading faded from Elena's face. My friends died in the valley of the Black Mountains that day, so I might have the chance to stop him. I heard their screaming, even in the heart of Erewhon's camp. I will not apologize for trying to end the slaughter so that the survivors could have a future. So you could have a future. 
So you used the lock, then chucked it into a ruin? We placed it inside the holy city on the plain, to be a commemoration of the lives lost. But a great cataclysm racked the land decades later, and the city sank. The marsh water flowed in, and the lock was forgotten. No one ever retrieved it. Its power had already been used. It was just a bit of metal and glass. And now it's not? If both my father and Deanna mentioned it, it must be vital in stopping Erewhon. Forgive me if I do not trust the word of a goddess who tried to use me like a puppet to blow this town to smithereens. Her methods were a roundabout, but she likely meant you no harm. Bullshit! Elena flickered again. Get to the stone marshes. Find the lock. I told Brandon and I'll tell you, we have more pressing matters at hand. My mother died to forge that lock, Elena snapped, eyes blazing bright. She let go of her mortal body so that she could forge the lock for my father. I was the one who broke the promise for how it was to be used. Aelin blinked, and Dorian wondered if he should indeed be worried when even she was speechless. But Aelin only whispered, Who was your mother? Dorian ransacked his memory, all his history lessons on his royal house, but couldn't recall. Elena made a sound that might have been a sob, her image fading into cobwebs and moonlight. She who loved my father best, she who blessed him with such mighty gifts and then bound herself in a mortal body and offered him the gift of her heart. Aelin's arms slackened at her sides. Adian blurted, Shit! Elena laughed humorlessly as he, she said to Aelin, Why do you think you burn so brightly? It's not just Brandon's blood that is in your veins, but Mala's. Aelin breathed. Mala Firebringer was your mother? Elena was already gone. Adian said, Honestly, it's a miracle you two didn't kill each other. Dorian didn't bother to correct him that it was technically impossible given that one of them was already dead. Rather, he weighed all that the queen had said and demanded. Rowan remaining silent seemed to be doing the same. Lysandra sniffed around the blood marks, as if testing for whatever remnants of the ancient queen might be around. Aelin stared out the open balcony doors, eyes hooded and a mouth tight lined. She unfurled her fist and examined the eye of Elena, still held in her palm. The clock struck one in the morning. Slowly, Aelin turned to them. To him. Mala's blood flows in our veins, she said hoarsely, fingers closing around the eye before she slipped it into the shirt po shirt's pocket. He blinked, realizing that it indeed did, that perhaps both of them had been so considerably gifted because of it. Dorian said to Rowan, if only because he might have heard or witnessed something in all his travels. Is it truly possible for God to become mortal like that? Rowan, who had been watching Aelin a bit warily, twisted to him. I've never heard of such a thing, but they have given up their immortality to bind their lives to that of their mortal mates. Dorian had the distinct feeling Aelin was deliberately examining a spot on her shirt. It's certainly possible Mala found a way to do it. It's not just possible, Aelin murmured. She did it. That pit of power I uncovered today. That was from Mala herself. Elena might be many things, but she wasn't lying about that. Lysandra shifted back into her human form, swaying enough that she set herself down on the bed before Adian could move to steady her. So what do we do now? she asked, her voice gravelly. Erwan's fleet squats in the Gulf of Oro. Maeve sails for Eelway, but neither knows that we possess this word key, or that this lock exists, and lies directly between their forces. For a heartbeat, Dorian felt like a useless fool as they all, including him, Look to Aelin. He was king of Otterlin, he reminded himself, equal to her, even if his lands and people had been stolen, his capital captured. But Aelin rubbed her eyes with her thumb and forefinger, losing a long breath. I really, really hate that old windbag. She lifted her head, surveying them all, and said simply, We sail for the stone marshes in the morning to hunt down the lock. Rolf and the Mycenaeans? Adian asked. He takes half his fleet to find the rest of the Mycenaeans, wherever they're hiding, and they all sail north to Terrasin. 
Rift told lies between here and there, and Wyvern's patrolling it, Adi encountered. And this plan depends on if we can trust Rolf to actually follow through on his promise. Rolf knows how to stay out of range, Rowan said. We have little choice but to trust him, and he honored the promise he made to Aelin regarding the slaves two and a half years ago. No doubt why Aelin had made him confirm it so thoroughly. And the other half of Rolf's fleet? Adian pushed. Some remain to hold the archipelago, Aelin said, and some come with us to Eelway. We can't fight Maeve's Armada with a fraction of Rolf's fleet, Adian said, crossing his arms. Dorian bit back his own agreement, leaving the general to, leaving the general to it. Let alone Morath's forces. I'm not going there to pick a fight, was all Aelin said, and that was that. They dispersed them. Aelin and Rowan slipping off to their own room. Dorian lay awake, even when his companion's breathing became deep and slow. He mulled over each word Elena had uttered, mulled over that long-ago appearance of Gavin, who had awoken him to stop Aelin from opening that portal. Perhaps Gavin had done it not to spare Aelin from damnation, but to keep those waiting, cold-eyed gods from seizing her as Deanna had today. He tucked the speculation away to consider when he was less prone to leaping to conclusions. But the threads lay in a lattice across his mind, in hues of red and green and gold and blue, glimmering and thrumming, whispering their secrets in languages not spoken in this world. An hour past dawn they departed, Skull's Bay on the swiftest shift Rolf could spare. Rolf didn't bother to say goodbye, already preoccupied with readying his fleet, before they sailed out of the sparkling harbor and into the lush archipelago beyond. He did grant Aelin one parting gift, vague coordinates for the lock. His map had found it, or rather, the general location. Some sort of wards must be placed around it, the captain warned them, if his tattoo could not pinpoint its resting place. But it was better than nothing, Dorian supposed. Aelin had grumbled as much. Rowan circled high above in hawk form, scouting behind and ahead. Fenris and Gavriel were at the oars, helping row them out of the harbor. Adian doing so as well, at a comfortable distance from his father. Dorian himself stood at the wheel beside the, swir the surely short captain, an older woman who had no interest in speaking to him, king or not. Lysandra swam in the surf below in some form or another, guarding them from any threats beneath the surface. But Aelin stood alone on the prow, her golden hair unbound and flowing behind her, so still that she might have been the twin to the figurehead mere feet beneath. The rising sun cast her in shimmering gold, no hint of the moonfire that had threatened to destroy them all. But even as the queen stood undimming before the shadows of the world, a lick of cold traced the contours of Dorian's heart, and he wondered if Aelin was somehow watching the archipelago, and the seas, and the skies, as if she might never see them again. Three days later, they were nearly out of the archipelago's strangling grasp. Dorian was again at the helm, Aelin at the prow, the others scattered on the various rounds of scouting and resting. His magic felt it before he did, a sense of awareness, of warning and awakening. He scanned the horizon. The fey warriors fell silent before the others. It looked like a cloud at first, a wind-tossed little cloud on this horizon. Then a large bird. When the sailors began rushing for their weapons, Dorian's mind at last spat out a name for the beast that swept toward them on shimmering, wide wings. Wyvern. There was only one, and only one rider atop it. A rider who did not move, whose white hair was unbound, listing toward the side, as the rider now was. The wyvern dropped lower, skimming over the water. Lysandra was instantly ready, waiting for the queen's order to shift into whatever form would fight it. No, the word ripped from Dorian's lips before he could think. But then it came out, over and over, as the wyvern and rider sailed closer to the ship. The witch was unconscious, her body leaning to the side because she was not awake, because that was blue blood all over her. Don't shoot! Don't shoot! Dorian was roaring the order as he hurtled for where Fenris had drawn his long bow, a black-tipped arrow aimed at the witch's exposed neck. His words were swallowed by the shouting of the sailors and their captain. Dorian's magic swelled as he unsheathed Damaris. But then Aelin's voice cut over the fray. Hold your fire! 
all of them halted. The wyvern sailed close, then banked, circling the boat. Blue blood crusted the beast's scarred sides. So much blood. The witch was barely in the saddle. Her tan face was leached of color, her lips paler than whalebone. The wyvern completed its circle, sweeping lower this time, readying to land as near the boat as possible. Not to attack, but for help. One moment the wyvern was soaring smoothly over the cobalt waves. Then the witch listed so far that her body seemed to go boneless, as if in that heartbeat, when help was mere feet away, whatever luck had kept her astride that, at last abandoned her. Silence fell on the ship as Manon Blackbeak tumbled from her saddle, falling through the wind, through wind and spindrift, and hit the water. And that was chapter 39 and where we are going to call it oh my for gosh. the night. Ending off with finishing part one. And next week we will start part two, which is called Fireheart. Wow. Mm-hmm. Such a cliffhanger to leave off on. But yeah. It just leaves off with Manon, unconscious. Half dead. In the water. 60%. 60%. We're over halfway yeah. through. Let's go. Let's go. Okay. As always, for your perusal, here is a tandem read guide. We just finished chapter 39 of Empire of Storms. As you can see, there is still a lot more chapters of Empire of Storms to go before we get back to Tower of Dawn. So the next few streams are probably going to be, like, solely Empire of Storms streams. <laughs> it's a big chunk. But all right.